So good morning, everybody. This is Kelly from Ocasa. Thank you very much for joining us for our first webinar of 2016. In honor of Human Trafficking Month, we are going to be talking about serving human trafficking survivors, effective systems, and individual level responses. I'm going to turn it over in a second to Jan and Terry, but before I do, um, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, Peter is here uh, and can help you with any, with any tech issues. So if you want to, if you look up in the corner, in the, it should be on the right side of your screen, um, you, could be, you should be able to get to a question slash chat box. And if you go ahead and type in there, Peter's going to be monitoring. So if you're having any tech issues, you can type it in there. As well as if you have any questions for our speakers, please go ahead uh, and type it right into, right into that box and we will monitor it, monitor it as we go. Um, if you are someone that put in a question, please know that we will get to it. If it's something that the speakers feel like they're going to cover, we'll maybe hold off on the question. Um, otherwise, please type in the questions as we go and we will uh, we'll interrupt them as, as we need to to get your questions answered. Um, I think that's about it. Oh, yeah, so before we get started, to sort of test out that text, uh, that chat question feature, if you could go ahead and type in there where you are logging in from, what community, uh, program and community or organization and community so we can have an idea, um, so our speakers can have an idea where you're, where you're coming in from. So we're going to give folks just a second to go ahead and do that. So we've got Jefferson and Price County, Walworth County, Vilas, Oneida Counties, Hope House, which is lots of counties, uh, Forest County, Great, Racine Marathon, Calumet, Outagamey. Great, thanks everyone. We've got a great representation from all, all across the state, so that's, that's great. Thanks, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, again, now you know how to use the question chat feature, so please go ahead and use that as, as we go along uh, to ask your questions, and we'll just go ahead and get started. So I'm going to turn it over to Jan and Terry. So good morning, everyone. It's glad, I'm glad to see that we've got people attending from many parts of the state. And um, so welcome and good morning. The topic this morning is serving human trafficking survivors. And when we're putting together this training, um, I was thinking about um, both systems and individual level responses. And from the work that we do at Respect um, daily, um, where we might be involved with outreach and recovering, um, stabilization, and then meeting the longer term needs of our um, the folks we serve, I really thought that it was important to not only address the individual level trauma response, and um, following my piece, you'll be hearing from Terry O'Donnell, uh, uh, our experienced trauma therapist working with the um, women that we, and, and children that we serve, um, and how important to be aware of um, what's going on with her. Um, but I also thought dealing with the system was a whole big part of the work we do and that I would link that to direct service provision. I think that if we respond effectively as a system, we can avoid re-traumatization of our victims um, and, you know, be, be more effective in our direct service provision. So, um, thus, the title systems and individual level responses. So um, typically, we might spend time talking about more in depth with the law or um, the precursors, what makes people vulnerable. Um, but today, um, the systems level and individual level um, uh, intervention. So here's an outline. Um, both Terry and I are not spectacular at making PowerPoints. Um, they'll be available for you to receive at request by Peter. Um, my piece of systems level, law, contradictions, reality, and uh, myths, and the lack of consensus. And I think that's what creates the problem for the people we serve, is this complicated um, set, of, set of myths and realities and really a lack of consensus on what the crime of human trafficking is and particularly today we're focusing on sex trafficking. And then what I call best principles instead of best practices. Yep, I think we surely know what best practices are but I think best principles when we're looking at systems level response is some, something we need to spend time on. 
and then some of the challenges. And from there will be a good um, link into um, Terry's piece, um, a really thorough, interesting piece on looking at um, the intersection of trauma, addiction, and the impact on daily functioning, and why some of um, the people that you may encounter um, through your helplines and in your shelters um, um, may present such complicated factors, but really um, what helps in some of the goals of therapy. So we'll be talking about that. That's a really interesting piece. Um, I've seen her PowerPoint. So anti-human trafficking laws. So what is human trafficking? And briefly, and in this instance, I am selecting out the sex trafficking piece. Um, many of you have taken courses or, uh, on human trafficking 101. But I want to set this out so you know what we're talking about um, with regard to the law. So it is the recruiting, enticing, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person or an attempt to do any of these. Um, this is a, I, I put together both the state and the federal law. Um, so by, there, there, need, there needs to be some kind of means, and that is force, fraud, or coercion, any scheme or plan um, threatening to cause harm, and in the Wisconsin law, um, controlling access to addictive controlled substances. So for adults, and this is the adult anti-human trafficking law, there needs to be this means piece. Um, for children, you do not have to have the means piece. Anybody under the age of 18. But when we look at the contradictions and complications um, in Wisconsin, um, part of it is this means test. And then lastly, for the purpose of a commercial sex act. Now, I just want to stop for a second, and if we get questions on this, um, go ahead and send them, and we can address them as we go, or um, we might save some for later. Now, a commercial sex act is any sex act on account of which anything of value is given to, promised, or received directly or indirectly by any person. Um, so it could be anything of value, promised, or received. Now, when we think of something called DMST, domestic minor sex trafficking, we are referring to the sexual exploitation within U.S. boundaries of a person under the age of 18. That person may be um, somebody who, has, who is a lawful permanent resident or a U.S. citizen or not. Um, but they are all protected um, under the domestic minor sex trafficking definition, whatever your citizen, citizenship. Now, with the domestic, uh, with, with the minors, um, there is no means test again, no need to show force, fraud, or coercion. So this is the law. Um, perpetrators um, include anyone who knowingly or should have known um, that they were benefiting in any manner from the trafficking of the child. So um, somebody who should have known um, often we are reluctant to pursue, pursue that um, avenue, but that is important to know um, that someone cannot turn a blind eye to where the benefits that they are receiving is coming from. All right. So the anti-human trafficking laws, and, and why I'm, I'm talking about this in, the, in terms of effective systems response and improving individual level response is to talk about the contradiction in the law. The anti-human trafficking laws protect adults victimized by the most severe forms. Those are those where you find elements of force, fraud, or coercion. But that doesn't mean um, that, let me push this back, I'm forgetting the order of my slides. Um, it doesn't mean that where there are no elements of force, fraud, or coercion present, that the person isn't a victim. So let me say that again. The anti-human trafficking laws protect only the most severe forms, where there are elements of force, fraud, or coercion. Where there are not elements of force, fraud, or coercion present, you can still be a victim of sex trafficking. But you may not be protected by the laws, because the laws only protect the most severe forms. All right. I'll come back to that. Now, another complication in the law. To be eligible for federal victim services, adults must, oops, that should be, and I meant to correct that, so um, Peter, that should be cooperate um, with law enforcement to qualify for resources and services, unless you're granted a waiver. 
So in our case at RESPECT, we have a federal grant to provide comprehensive case management services to victims of um, human trafficking um, and for adults in order to qualify for the full range of benefits um, unless a grant, um, a waiver is granted, um, they must cooperate with law enforcement. So um, reasons to grant a waiver could be that it is too dangerous, right? Um, often when I get to this piece with a victim, talking to her about her needs, if I mention this without adequate preparation, this can really scare a person off, right? We don't, we want to deal with an intervention first rather than an investigation. Um, and that's the model. However, embedded in our victim services uh, provisions of the um, um, federal, um, our federal grant is this requirement unless you are granted a waiver. All right, so uh, you know, I'm sort of leading then into some of the contradictions and confusions about this issue. Now, you know, this, I, I, I'm hoping that just looking at the law and how and, and what it dictates, how that is going to impact on the ground how we provide services. So that at respect, you know, there is no test on how serious the form of your victimization is. You know, we serve all victims of human trafficking and some are the federal or state anti-human trafficking laws will protect. And you know, it's not unlike the other aspects of responding to violence against women, right? That somebody could have been raped or assaulted, but the facts of her case do not fit um, you know, uh, the law, and so they may not be prosecuted, but that doesn't mean that the person hasn't been raped, right? So um, that's you know, similar um, um, to that kind of scenario. So contradiction and conflict, um, and, then, and then similarly then, you know, why should I get help? What's the point? Disclosure may not have any positive consequence, those kinds of things. So um, again, why the law, the systems, response, our attitudes um, that we bring, our values can really impact um, our direct services to the point where people will just not come in, right? Um, so contradiction and um, confusion. So, you know, what we refer to in this work is the iconic victim. I'm sure that you are familiar with what we mean by the iconic victim in other work that um, we do in responding to violence against women, right? So the anti-human trafficking laws envision a prototypical passive victim with several characteristics, right? And, you know, it's important, Terry and I were saying that while we will be using women and girl or she, that, you know, um, certainly victims are boys and men. But, the, um, but the, the characteristic of the iconic victim would be um, this prototypical passive um, victim, a woman or a girl, um, somebody who would be a good witness, right? Not be complicated by other um, factors that may call into question whether she's telling the truth or not. Um, somebody who cooperates fully with law enforcement, somebody who's rescued instead of um, escaping or leaving. Um, somebody who is innocent and helpless. Um, this iconic um, victim doesn't capture the reality of many victim situations. Um, and in fact, many exercise some free will in a trafficking scenario. Doesn't mean that she is not a victim. Um, in fact, you know, it isn't really, consent is actually not an element of the law. I mean, sometimes people consent under a range of really oppressive options, right? Um, and exercise some free will in that um, violent scenario. And um, somebody may leave um, and escape without the help of law enforcement. And that happens all the time. I meet people who um, find their own way out. Um, and so the number of victims we serve yearly, I know is just a slice, and that most get out themselves. So this is the iconic um, victim. And, and most um, damaging about the iconic victim narrative is that if you don't fit this narrative, you can be viewed as dangerous, manipulative, criminal, and a, and a drain on services, unworthy of services. So, um, you know, I, 
Um, I, I, I am so glad that we have the state and federal law. I think it's a good start. I think, um, as some of you know, there um, have been amendments to the state law. Um, there are efforts to make the law better ongoing. There's a hearing now um, to, to do that. Um, so it is um, the unfortunate, I think, unintended consequence of the original legislation that it sort of embeds um, some of the iconic victim narratives. Um, so I know for those of you who do this work, uh, many of you are doing sexual assault and domestic violence. You know how, um, you know, what it takes for people to survive. Um, Terry's going to be talking more about why and how that happens. Um, and how this expectation um, can lead for the systems to view victims as dangerous, manipulative, criminal, or unworthy of services. So again, why I think looking at the system's um, response and its implication on direct service provision. And then the other, um, so we have the iconic victim narrative. Contradiction and confusion. Child sex trafficking victim or child prostitute. So that's the other piece that I wanted to lay out there. And again, to um, articulate what many of you are aware of, and again, to um, validate for you, I'm sure, the experience in your work about this lack of consensus. You know somebody's a victim, but everybody is not treating her that way. And you are just angry. So I am taking the time to validate this for you, <laughs> because I know you know it. But then also to realize that these are um, um, that the victims know this. <laughs> and so to demonstrate that you're, you, you are aware of this um, goes really, really far um, in how you, um, you know, you're not directly talking about this, but you understand the space that this victim has resided. So child sex trafficking victim or child prostitute. So in Wisconsin, we still have a child prostitution um, crime on the books. Now there, for many people, will um, support the existence of that statute because sometimes that might be the only way to get a child to safety. Um, that aside, um, you know, what I want to talk about today is that because of that, law enforcement routinely looks for force, fraud, or coercion with juveniles when the means test is not in the federal or the state law. So they basically bypass the protections and benefits available to child victims of sex trafficking. So I wanted to say that again, that youth under the age of 18 do not have a means test when, with regard to the federal and state anti-human trafficking protections. But because in Wisconsin we have a child prostitution, prostitution statute, I think it would be accurate to say that law enforcement routine, routinely is looking for forced fraud or coercion, or what we would call the most severe forms um, of sex trafficking, bypassing the protections and benefits of child victims of sex trafficking. So for those of you who are tuning in and you have somebody who is a juvenile, this is that dilemma I'm sure you have faced where the system is treating a juvenile as though she is a criminal. So um, again, um, you know, part of the confusion and contradiction, the systems pieces that we have to, that, that really um, weigh, you know, come down really heavy on victims on the ground. Um, so, and, and then there, there's just a sort of um, historic confusion and contradiction about prostitution in general. You know, you have these um, two polarizing positions, um, uh, prostitution as um, empowering and lucrative, um, or um, victims to be pitied and rescued, and then, you know, this other pole to be feared and punished. So I, I want to say in effectively dealing with the system's confusion and our society's lack of consensus, not to fake focus on this debate. Um, it really isn't necessary. Under pressure to take a side, victims will just not use services. There is no test uh, whether or not you are eligi eligible um, for services. You know, um, do not, it's unnecessary. That, that debate, um, depending upon 
you know, how early she entered into a system of prostitution to her current age, she is well aware of. Um, it is more um, a question of, you know, needing vital services that could help her. Um, and so from a provider's point of view, again, this system's contradiction and confusion should not matter on the ground. So by the existence of prostitution, I am talking about a failed system of bodies, adults or children, for sex, for anything of value, um, and that the prostituted person, not the prostitute, but the prostituted person is the supply or sex object for sale. And again, not everyone we serve is protected by anti-human trafficking laws, but everyone we serve has been victimized by systems of prostitution. So I often am asked, you know, the difference between sex trafficking and prostitution. Um, all in sex trafficking um, are victimized by systems of prostitution. Not all are protected by anti-human trafficking laws. That's the difference. Now, um, some of the realities, right? So we did the law, some of the confusion and contradictions and lack of um, consensus. Some realities. Um, the increase in poverty and the decline in social services and the need for safe and affordable housing have made women increasingly more vulnerable to victimization. It's kind of a, you know, economic test. Um, and not only that, um, her any kind of negotiation, any kind of ability to have some um, free will, free will in the um, in the scenario that I, I uh, mentioned in contradict contradicting the iconic victim narrative um, is lessened, right? The poorer you are, the less services any kind of negotiation in um, with, um, with a trick or a pimp is minimized, right? So um, the increase in poverty, decline in social services, the need for housing, and many other things make women more vulnerable and decreases any amount of negotiating um, um, that she may have had um, in the past. And another fact, a reality, that women and children, um, and these, I could provide you the articles. I didn't um, include all the articles. I know, Terry, you have all your articles at the end of your slide. Um, this is... Um, uh, Barkin and um, Farley, women in prostitution are routinely assaulted, assaulted both by physically and sexually by clients and pimps, um, that over 60%, I think it was even maybe 66%, um, uh, can be clinically diagnosed with PTSD. So again, just kind of contradicting. Um, on prior se sexual abuse, um, particularly when sustained over time as an incest has um, predisposed many women, making them particularly um, vulnerable to other exploitations and not fighting back. Kathleen Mary, the author of Female Sexual Slavery and the Prostitution of Sexuality. And then um, this is the last um, kind of fact I included. This is from a United Nations report on trafficking, and it's international trafficking that includes the U.S. It's just looking at places outside of the U.S. too. Um, women and children who have been prostituted, and, and they're using... Um, women and children, but we know that victims can be men, um, are victims of sexual abuse by definition and should receive sexual assault recovery services. So it doesn't have the, um, the means test, right? It doesn't have forced fraud or coercion. It doesn't have you know, a value judgment of how you got into that situation. It says that the system of prostitution is um, assaultive itself, to however degree a woman might describe it. Some may say not much. Someone say not at all. Someone says a lot. But that they should be able to receive sexual assault recovery services, right? So no means. To. Um, one question. Uh, are there more current resources? Um, yes. When it comes to um, best practices, there is a lot of good resources. Um, Terry's going to talk about precursors and vulnerabilities. Um, I have a presentation that I have a lot of um, more current research, uh, research. I have to tell you, the field has grown. There's early research on impact of childhood sexual abuse um, and, um, and other factors that um, may contribute to being vulnerable a lot. 
so I don't want to leave you with the impression that um, it is easy and um, simple. Um, and then out of Minnesota in particular, there has been some um, evaluation um, done by the feds to help set up a best practices um, uh, manual, if you will, uh, responding to human trafficking. So yes, I could bring you that another time um, to talk about the, that, that level. Um, but just again laying out to um, you, and I, I'm kind of preaching to the choir, but you guys you know, know that when you're dealing with law enforcement and, and, and um, you know, uh, not always a medical, medical can be sometimes the most informed, but not always, you know, schools, um, that they um, still, you know, are acting on myths. So that's really the only purpose. So thank you for that question. There's a lot more. Um, so thank you. I, I can I can get that to you. Um, something that is um, part of I would call this medium, <laughs> this uh, medium um, research all the way to current is, um, I'm including because we also have to look at our system, our practice within our system, and so and the kinds of discussions that. Um, um, we might have with our with victims, right? Why did this happen to me? You know, wanting to understand because we are often in this work, like others doing sexual assault and domestic violence, are doing consciousness raising, right? So something that I, I am including, and I, perhaps I am hammering down on this a bit, is to think about traditional cultural practices um, that we don't question. So I'm just responding here when I'm looking at the lack of consensus on that, it's the oldest profession, right? That kind of thing. So um, this idea of um, persistence of practices um, spanning generations that are not questioned, right? And that often we know that these are arising of subordination of the feminine or of women and girls. And so they create practices that may appear to be chosen or could even be represented as being in their interests. So again, um, if anything, to check our own brains about this, to have our own consciousness raised. Um, so things then take on the appearance of choice, agency, empowerment. And important in this slide is that, you know, in this um, scenario, the oldest practice, uh, profession, right, the status of the victim or the person prostituted does not necessarily change, right? She's still judged. But the business of profiting off of her becomes more respectable, right? So I think that's just important to, um, to add. I think that um, I'm preaching to the choir on this, so I apologize. Um, again, it takes us beyond the um, discussion of choice. And, and then lastly, just to um, say that because it, if we, again, there's lack of consensus, if we believe it is cultural and not natural, then it can be brought to an end. Right, um, and you know when I speak with victims and I talk about the challenges and the, what, what I would call the social justice component, it doesn't require. I know I know some of you who are uh, attending. It isn't really um, at all getting political, if you will. Um, I think people know this. I think it just validates if we know it too. Um, and 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 um, people may disagree, um, and that is. Absolutely, I think, valid. Um, so best principles. So the um, Wisconsin Anti-Human Trafficking Consortium, um, originally members um, were the Wisconsin Coalition Against Sexual Assault and, and Domestic Abuse Wisconsin, and a number of us um, evolved into what is now known as the Anti-Human Trafficking Consortium. Many of you may have participated in the 2008 study, um, the first attempt to gauge trafficking in Wisconsin. And so this data is from 2008. But um, its more recent project was the Anti-Human Trafficking Protocol and Research Manual that you can find at Wicasa's website. And we spent a lot of time, it took a couple of years to make this, but it spent a lot of time on what I thought was this, the statement of purpose and our guiding principles. And so that's what I am calling best principles. Um, how do we respond as systems to this contradiction and confusion as sexual assault service providers? Um, the statement of purpose was to 
um, for the consortium was to advocate for victims of human trafficking, uphold principles of human rights, and create an environment where human trafficking is not tolerated, um, include survivors in shaping the anti-human trafficking movement, and promote respectful collaboration with and between communities working to identify, serve, and protect victims. Um, I included this because when I um, respond to calls from places who around the state, particularly outside of Milwaukee County and Dane County, um, it's, it, it's difficult to achieve that third um, environment, um, collaborating um, with and between communities. Um, the, that that um, perhaps you know your relationship with your jail or your juvenile detention center are all um, create barriers to um, identifying victims who may be channeled into the criminal justice system. So um, when they begin to organize in response to this issue as a system to, um, like all of us have um, signed on to a uh, statement of purpose for WICASA, um, similarly I would urge you to sign on to a statement of purpose about um, anti-human trafficking when you organize in your communities, right? Otherwise, it can really run amok. Guiding principles, right? Human trafficking is a violation of human rights. All persons have a right to be free of labor and sexual exploitation in all of its forms. And this third one, the intersection of oppressions, right? Increased vulnerability to people, um, um, of people to trafficking. Individuals alone cannot end the conditions. So we have to have a broad community response necessary to make a substantive and social institutional change. So my contention is to respond um, effectively directly to our clients, we have to respond as a community, like we do in domestic violence and sexual assault. We have to work for systemic change. Um, and so I'm clearly putting this issue um, squarely where the rest of um, you all are. And then, of course, a victim's rights and victim-centered response. Um, and again, um, you know, this is not necessarily what is happening in many of our communities. This is really um, important. I think um, you have a right to be identified. So, you know, somebody could be arrested for prostitution, but nobody ever asked her, are you being pimped? You know, um, so you have a right to be identified. You have a right to be believed. Um, and then to be treated with dignity, sensitively, and with respect, to be uh, provided with cultural and linguistic um, needs. I mean, you have a right to be protected, informed of your choices. Um, given accurate and timely information about cases. Now, let me tell you that, and given equal protection, um, treatment, and all of this, right? You know, this is so familiar to you all, but I know you know that this isn't the, the case when there's still a question, is she a prostitute, in quotes, or is she a victim of human trafficking? Um, so, um, again, um, what our approach is, and what I think is, um, you know, in our field, and, and, and I think we're seeing an erosion in the consensus in sexual assault and domestic violence, too, all the while, while we're trying to push further into looking at the sexual assault needs of some of the most marginalized. So we really have to work together. Um, now, few resources are designated solely um, for victims of human trafficking, so many of you are responding to um, sexual assault, domestic violence, immigration needs, that sort of thing. So um, kind of a quick base, um, best principle, best practice, organizations should train their staff on, on human trafficking, the laws, the um, systems, you know, how to identify and so forth, a whole other set of, um, of material. Um, and then to develop an internal policy and have a designated staff person. Should a staff person encounter a victim that they would direct that person to? Um, identify a network of law enforcement and victim assistance providers beforehand and build that um, integrated into the rest of your work and recognizing how complicated this is and sometimes even our own sexual assault workers and advocates in our agency may um, subconsciously or unconsciously um, be biased, right? So we have to keep checking ourselves. If you don't have a designated law enforcement or service provider, I refer you to the federal, to federal law enforcement and federal victim witness. And I was hoping to have somebody from the U.S. Attorney with us today, but she could not attend. Um, but in the areas of the state um, where you may have limited law enforcement response, committed but, but, but maybe limited, maybe serving large regions of the state, um, you know your communities, so you have to do the work. 
you know who your community is, you know how it works. And you can build a relationship with federal law enforcement, whether or state, with the State Department of Justice or with the federal um, U.S. Attorney or the FBI, um, and can help your law enforcement with a case, but they can also provide services to victims. Again, the complication in the federal law for adults being that they have to cooperate with law enforcement. Additionally, if you're in a part of the state that has few resources for human trafficking victims, particularly sex trafficking victims, through the Wisconsin Anti-Human Trafficking Consortium, we have resources that are available by request to pay for bus tickets to return someone home, kind of small expenses. So, um, Peter, if anyone wants to know about that, too, we'll follow up with that. Um, and then um, the, the direct service providers um, providing advocacy. Um, case, this is the, the protocol's um, model. Advocacy, case management, safety planning, stabilization of basic needs, intermediate and long-term planning, information um, about rights and protections. Um, and then lastly, that we need to believe the victim, even if law enforcement doesn't, or the law doesn't protect the victim. Um, I think I will end there. And I'm going to scoot, scoot, scoot. Is, is, is it going to follow? OK, so um, perhaps we can take some questions while um, Peter is um, setting up Terry. So if anyone has a question, they can go ahead and type that into, into the chat. And again, we'll keep monitoring questions throughout. So if you have additional questions, please feel free to use the, use the chat box and we'll get them to Jan and Terry. Okay, we don't have any questions, so we'll go ahead and, and keep moving. So you're up, Terry. Okay, my name is Terry O'Donnell, and I'm a licensed therapist, and I work with Project Respect. So I'm going to give you a profile of the victim, and I have to warn you, it's complicated. I know you probably know that. They're not an easy profile. It's not simple what their childhood has been and where they are today is not simple. And I think that's why it can be really difficult on figuring out how to support them. So sex trafficking victims often get into prostitution in their youth and have a history of trauma. So you can think about the vulnerability of being in their youth and with the history of trauma, we look at the, the four most um, damaging experiences someone can have that cause trauma as a child. Starting with and being the most damaging is verbal and emotional abuse. More damaging than the others listed on the page. So if a child has experienced verbal and emotional abuse or loss of a caregiver, loss of a caregiver could be a parent going to prison, um, a parent leaving the family, a parent passing away, poorly functioning caregiver. Many times they have parents um, that are alcoholics or are deeply involved in drug abuse and have addictions and are not available or are not capable of caring for them. They may have parents who have mental illness. And then the fourth is physical sexual abuse. So I'm not sure, when I saw this list and I saw that verbal and emotional abuse was worse than physical and sexual abuse, I was, I was surprised. Trauma symptoms that start when the person has the trauma. So if you're a kid and you've experienced any of the four traumas that we looked at in the previous screen, some of the symptoms you're going to show is you're going to have flashbacks meaning that you're going to have memories of the trauma that pop into your brain. It often, if a child has had trauma as a young child, like say five or six years old, I've had a lot of clients who are in their fifth and sixth grade start to have flashbacks. 
and they can't focus in school at all. They have nightmares, which means they're not sleeping well. They have a lot of anxiety, which means they're sitting in class and all of a sudden their anxiety kicks into their body and they can't focus on what's happening in school. They have a depressed mood, difficulty concentrating. They're easily startled. Their thoughts are racing again, not able to concentrate. They're hypervigilant. Kind of a tough start when you're in, in elementary school and middle school. So addiction to drugs and alcohol are coping mechanisms for those trauma symptoms. And it's really important for people to realize that addiction is the, not the problem. Addiction is a solution to the problem, and the problem is the trauma and the trauma symptoms. And people get pretty instant relief, even if it's for a short time, and it causes a lot of problems afterwards, they're getting relief, and that relief is really significant. They also might not be living in environments where they're getting help for their PTSD symptoms. It's kind of a, it can be a family thing, you know, what they're experiencing, their parent, their mother experienced as a child, it can be really repeat. So what we think of as a safe setting often doesn't feel, feel safe by the victim. So, and I had a client re reiterate this to me recently. She said, you get confused on what's safe and unsafe because you should feel safe in your home. You should feel safe with your parents. You should feel safe in your school setting. But they have experienced trauma in one or more of those settings. And so it's hard to understand what is safe. If you can't trust your parents, you can't trust anyone. And their brains are always in fight or flight, meaning that the survival part of your brain, when that's kicked in, you're in fight or flight, and your logical brain isn't, oh, isn't operating. It's more the fight or flight part of your brain that's in charge. So the logical, rational part of your brain isn't kicking in, and so they're not accessing any logic, any rational thinking. They're accessing emotion and survival. So trauma symptoms affect daily functioning. Now, this is daily functioning as an adult. So there, it's difficult to hold down, hold down a job, especially if they have a ton of anxiety. So they, it's hard for them to imagine being able to work in a traditional work setting. And that sets them up for prostitution where they could make more money than they could ever make in a job that they're qualified for. A lot of times they haven't completed high school because they couldn't focus. They couldn't listen in school. They got way behind, way back in third and fourth grade. And so they, they didn't finish a high school degree, and they don't remember a lot. So they're unable to leave their homes a lot of times. If they're in high anxiety or they're in a depressed state, it's hard to get out of bed. It's a challenge just to parent their children. Sometimes even meeting the basic needs for their children is difficult. They choose unhealthy intimate relationships, and this is often directly related to trauma. Um, they're easily controlled and influenced by other people, and it's hard for them to manage money. And all of this is really due to the trauma symptoms that they suffer from. So not being able to manage their money isn't necessarily that they're spending a lot of money, but it's difficult for them to focus and concentrate enough to recognize, you know, budgeting and that takes a lot of logical thinking. They have, they've have had the following problems since childhood. Okay, so difficulty regulating emotional state. When a child has had trauma, their nervous system is not synchronized, meaning, you know, the part of our nervous system that, that kicks in adrenaline to make us take an action to protect ourselves, and then the part of our nervous system that calms us down. They're in a high emotional state most of the time as a child. So if you think of a faucet, you think of hot water and cold water. Hot water would be your nervous system when it's kicking in adrenaline. Cold water would be your nervous system when it's calling you, calming you down. So they're having trauma and they're experiencing in their homes or in a daily setting. And so they, are, uh, they have hot water running all the time. And eventually their brain adjusts to that so they don't have any cold water running to calm them down. 
So they're either very agitated, um, highly strung, or they shut themselves all the way down. And either, in either situation, they're still in high anxiety. So because of that, it's difficult to concentrate and pay attention. They suffer from self-hate, which is the verbal emotional abuse that they've experienced, and a lack of impulse control. And these are all due to the impact the trauma has had on the functioning of their brain. So they've missed normal developmental stages that other kids have. So for example, they're in extreme emotional states. They're acting out in class or they're completely withdrawn in class. Kids kind of reject those, uh, those kids because, you know, that kind of stresses other kids out. So they end up spending a lot of time alone and feeling rejected or pushed away or not liked. And so they, list, they miss out those social skills that kills kids in that age, elementary, middle school experience, you know, where you're a friend or you're not a friend and your friend hurts your feelings. And those simple experiences that we've all gone through when we don't have trauma get missed for the kids who have trauma. And so they don't have, they haven't developed social skills. So you think about an adult without those social skills, and there's only certain places where they feel they um, can be accepted. And they're often accepted by kids who are like them. And they haven't learned boundaries. Their boundaries were violated when they were a kid, and they, they've never learned how to set boundaries. So interesting note, girls who have been sexually abused experience hormonal changes one and a half year excuse me they experience hormonal changes one and a half years earlier than non abused girls. This is based on research. Um, they excrete three to six times more sex hormones. And then of course they lack the developmental milestones that we talked about previously. So they're often more sexually active and they've been their self-esteem is really low because they've had a lot of verbal and emotional abuse. So they're, you can kind of start to see how they're being set up. So a normal person's brain versus a traumatized person's brain. A normal person's brain, meaning a person who has not had severe trauma, you know, there's people that have had trauma in their life, but it, it can, the time of, the age that you have the trauma is really important and the environment that you're growing up in is really important. So, for a person who isn't suffering from trauma, their brain works together, meaning the different parts of your brain are synchronizing with each other. But when a person has trauma, the brain is not synchronizing. So, they're again, again, spend a lot of time in fight or flight, meaning they're in survival mode. And so they can't filter out what's important and not important. They have difficulty figuring things out, and they aren't able to access the logic, and they're not learning from their experiences. Now, this is not intentional behavior, and we often can say, well, you know, you've had this experience, why would you repeat it? Because of the trauma and the impact it's had on their brain, they aren't capable of applying that information. And so that's why you may be seeing some behaviors that are repeating and can, it can be very challenging on how to help them when that's happening. So the self-hate, the verbal emotional abuse, the lack of friendships in elementary and middle school creates a vulnerability for the victim. So they meet a pimp or the trafficker and this person is very charming and says things that they have not been told for a very long time or ever maybe. Starts to create a bond and there's an irrational belief but they haven't had this kind of treatment before. So they feel more cared about. Maybe the first time they're told that they're beautiful or sexy or whatever. Um, it also sets them up to feel like what their, that their body, what they offer with their physical body is what gives them value. So they, some of their survival needs might be taken care of and a dependency or a loyalty gets developed. 
And that can be why it's difficult to um, go to court and you know set that victim, uh, that trafficker up as um, bad. You know, they there's some loyalty that gets developed because of all of the things that have happened up to this point. And it isn't they. It's not. There's no complying. They feel like they have to do it. They can't. They they can't fight back. That option to comply is required for them. So they also have really poor health. Um, they're not eating healthy. They're not connected to their internal body. And there's something that determines our health called heart rate variability. High heart rate variability is you breathe in, your heart rate goes up. You breathe out, your heart rate goes down. The higher um, the spike and the lower the spike, the healthier you are. When a person breathes shallowly, and that's one of the characteristics of trauma is they have shallow breathing, is their heart rate isn't going up as high or as low. So this affects the nervous system. It affects all parts of their body. So even just having them start to do some deep breathing can have a positive impact. Having them be more connected to their bodies can have a positive impact. Having them eat better can be a positive impact. And a lot of them will develop diabetes because of all of this, which is, we see that pretty often. So what helps? Breathing exercises are really helpful. You know, just the exercise of put, have them put their hand on their chest and their hand on their belly and have them breathe in, and it's called belly breathing, so have them only have the hand on their belly move when they breathe in. That can be calm, that can give them a sense of more calm. Um, there's lots of exercises like breathing in where you breathe in to the count of four, you hold your breath to the count of six, you release your breath to the count of seven. That's another, you know, when, when you're breathing shallowly, you're not releasing the air fully. So that's another exercise that can calm a body down. So lots of breathing exercises can be really helpful, especially if they're in high anxiety at the moment that you're interacting with them. You can just have them do some breathing. And, you know, another one is you, you visualize you're holding like about a softball right around your belly area. And when you breathe in, your hands come apart. And when you breathe out, your hands come together. And the combination of the breathing and moving their hands can be very calming. There's lots of breathing exercises that can happen that are really good for calming their bodies down. And it's, you know, they're not used to that. So, but it will, you will be, you'll be amazed. It'll, they'll shift and start to be a little bit more relaxed. Yoga is an excellent form of healing for trauma. It requires you to be in your body. So if there is any possibility of setting up any kind of a program where they can do yoga, that will really help them a lot. All the martial arts are very good. Um, I don't know if you've heard about adult coloring books, but <laughs> their art is really good for calming somebody. So let's say that you are meeting with them either over the phone or in your office. You could have crayons and a coloring book sitting there, and if they're really in high anxiety, you could just have them go ahead and start coloring, and it will, it will help them relax. It's something they can also do at home with their children. Music and dancing are also really good. You think about dancing. You have to be present. You have to be in the moment in order to dance. And the key thing is, is being in the moment. Um, that mindfulness of being in the moment of their life, they're generally much better than being trapped in the past or the fears of the future. And there are tons of fears, you know. They don't have high school education. Their job doesn't cover, a, a tra traditional jobs will not cover rent. So there's a lot of stress and worry about the future. And you know, their kids are acting out because the parent isn't doing well. So there, there is not an easy spot for them to be in. Tai Chi and Qigong are both very good. Um, the breathing exercise with the ball, the softball moving in and out is a Qigong breathing exercise. Neurofeedback, which, which is just starting to surface as a really effective way to reduce trauma is also not another good route. Therapy, uh, but you know, even as a trauma therapist, 
therapy isn't the best out of all these. Some of these other ones are even are better than therapy. And so if you can, you know, it's good for them to see a therapist that can help, but just talking about stuff isn't really necessarily going to help them heal trauma. It's really getting connected to their body that's going to help. Medication has limited help. Um, and sometimes, you know, there are mental health issues, so medication can make a difference, but it's not the, it often will not bring the anxiety down. A lot of people don't have success with medication for their anxiety, unless they choose something that is more addictive and that becomes another problem. So meditation is excellent for calming the brain. Um, and even if they can do it, sometimes with my clients, I'll just do a two-minute meditation. And I'll set a timer for two minutes, and I'll just have them visualize, you know, even thinking, breathe in, breathe out. Just thinking about that in their mind. Breathe in, breathe out. Or you can have them visualize breathing in through their forehead, like actually taking air into your forehead, releasing it through your face, or taking air into to your chest and releasing it through your face, releasing tension in your jaw area. And if you just do that, time it for two minutes and have them do that, they often will tell you, oh, I feel tired. And it's because their body is calmer and they haven't been calm for a long time. So that can be a really good meditation tool and two minutes is minimal, minimal amount of time. EMDR is another good um, trauma healing technique. Brain spotting is kind of a, um, is a little newer, but it, it was discovered by an EMDR therapist, and that, that can be very effective as well. So the goal of therapy, and I would even say that some of the goal of some of the, of the work you're doing is helping them develop a sense of who they are. Just being connected to their body. That is a new thing for them. So if they are, if you're around them and you just have them close their eyes and take a few deep breaths and I've even had clients do something, it's called somatic sensing where I have them, you know, where is the anxiety in your body? And they'll tell me where it's at and I'll say, well, hang out there with that spot in your body. Just hang out there, observe it, kind of befriend that part of your body. And when they do that, that part of their body relaxes. So just getting to more connected to their body will make a huge difference. Helping them believe that they can stand up for themselves. They, helping them figure out how to set boundaries, role playing how to set boundaries. What can you say? Helping them do that, really acknowledging to them it is hard to stand up for themselves. They have not been able to do that for a very long time. They weren't allowed to do that for a very long time. So helping them stand up for themselves can make a really big difference. And that they can take care of themselves. Very important because they don't believe those things right now. So that it brings us to the, oh, I have some resources. Bessel van der Kolk is a psychiatrist who has specialized in trauma for a very long time. He wrote the book, The Body Keeps the Score. And a lot of this presentation comes from him. Peter Levine wrote a book, Waking the Tiger and Healing Trauma. Um, there's a trauma center in Boston. And there's the National Center for Child Traumatic Stress Complex Trauma Network. Both of those places have articles and things that you can read. Now, it's interesting to note the trauma center in Boston, which Bessel van der Kolk is involved with, they teach um, yoga there. And they did studies that showed when people had therapy versus yoga, the clients that did yoga got better than the ones who did talk therapy. So it gives you a sense that talk therapy, it's, it's part of it, but it's not all of it, and it's not the most important piece either. Thank you. Okay. That's great. So again, we will open it up for questions. If folks have any questions, Peter's monitoring the chat, so go ahead and type it, uh, type it in the chat, your questions for either Terry or Jen. So we'll give people a second to do that.
Um, Terry, while, while they're, we're waiting for questions, I, 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 what I, I think um, is really helpful for me to hear from you is that that when when people can manage their trauma symptoms better, um, then they can achieve the goals that right. um, they like to achieve. But it also, you know, something that we call vigilantism, essentially, um, where we have victims. Um, who do not trust our system's capacity to serve them, or that we um, actually care. And so they become vulnerable to fall into hands of those um, that say, well, we'll take care of you, right? Exactly. And so it's just really this link, um, breaking that, that um, the empowerment, breaking that um, pattern of um, either going to the system that may not be adequately um, aware to help you or to people who say they will help you but won't. And so when you were talking about the yoga and all those kinds of things that can empower a person. Mm -hmm. I was breathing. <laughs> I was And I wrote, yeah. out, I wrote out the 467 actually, so I'm going to, anyway. Yeah. But so I just wanted to, to say how these can improve um, daily functioning because otherwise what you all know is that the um, we have the criminalization of trauma symptoms, essentially. Right. Um, or somebody may just simply um, become vulnerable and be, become subjected to even more and more trauma. Mm -hmm. um, and those are very good options. Right. Yeah. Um, one, qu one question uh, that we have is um, if someone, you know, you reference limited resources, you know, particularly outside of, you know, outside of the Madison, Milwaukee area, um, what what suggestions do you have for folks? We have a lot of people on the call from those areas. Uh -huh. What some suggestions do you have for folks to sort of like either start learning about tra trafficking, start you know, like wh how, where do they start? So if you have somebody that you believe is a victim, and you have access to her, um, and you have been told so th there's been an outcry. Um, you know, and you don't have resources in your community, I would encourage you to call the Wisconsin Department of Justice for investigation if your local law enforcement um, needs support. Um, or, if, you know, and, and, and I would want you to stay and try to work best with your local enforcement because you know your community. You know what it looks like. You know how it works. But you can bring in the cavalry, if you will, from the state. And also, you know, I, I work a lot because even if we have a grant to work solely with victims, our resources are limited. And so I often am working with the FBI victim witness. Her name is Lori Schmidt. I'll give you her phone number, but I don't have it, but you can get it from. And she um, won't mind me saying that because I refer folks um, often for some of you who know me, you probably know Lori. Um, and she is. Um, up until this year, assigned to the whole state, but she's based in Milwaukee. Um, coming up soon, there will be two federal victim witness to um, serve the whole state. Um, and um, if there's an investigation, um, I have been able to, um, they've been able to transport victims outside of the state um, to um, specialized inpatient treatment programs. So um, I'd either call the Department of Justice, I would call um, the U.S. Attorney's Office, whether you're in the Eastern District of Wisconsin or the Western District. You could call us and on behalf, respect, and on behalf of the consortium, um, we have people who donate to the consortium. And for us, whether or not that person has an investigation open or not, we have provided funds for bus tickets, you know, um, uh, regional bus tickets too, you know, not just, you know, local, but Greyhound, that sort of thing, how people return home, um, and really um, allow the provider to screen. Um, and we just trust you. This is what you need, it needs. This is um, the situation needs. Um, and so yeah, training is important. So these opportunities are important because um, um, you, know, you know your community. You, you know your victim. And so if you call us, we can help. And I also know that we have to work well with each other. I saw that Lacey um, um, from Hope House was online. And we, um, I, I, I um, can't say how often that we are working together. 
um, between counties there. So, um, you know, coming together, either attending the consortium meeting so you can get to know resources in your um, statewide, but organizing locally what we call a community coordinate, coordinated response group um, so that you can proactively identify um, resources. Actually, what we had to do was we had the problem and so we had to pull everybody together to kind of build it. Um, and even then, it, you know, we, we um, don't have sufficient resources. So um, through the consortium, um, through the State Department of Justice, or through the U.S. Attorney Office or the um, federal or the FBI. Thank you. Got a couple more questions. How can we assist human trafficking survivors while staying in our DVSA shelter? Are there particular things we need to focus on or no? Some, some, here, I think I'm going to ask you to respond to this question. Sometimes, sometimes folks, um, um, human trafficking victims in shelter, because of those um, trauma symptoms that Terry um, was describing, often are unsuccessful in shelter. Um, sometimes they can begin to engage in behaviors that are coping behaviors that are um, create dangers for other um, victims right. in your shelter. So Terry, you know, when you have somebody in a shelter who is really in their stuff. Yeah. So breathing exercises would really be a good start. The three breathing exercises that I <clears throat> talked about will be very helpful. Um, meditation would be really helpful. There's also very calming music. It's bilateral is what it's called, which means that it goes, it changes from ear to ear. You need a little headset to wear it because you want it to be, you want it to them to be um, enclosed around their ear. But if they wear a headset and they listen to this bilateral music, going from ear to ear, it really calms them and it's meant to balance their brain more. So that would be a really good way to help them, even just to have them go and listen to that music. Um, and you can type in bilateral music in iTunes, and I'm sure some will come up. And if you need I can I can name some music if anyone I don't have it with me today but I can get it to people if they want that. Um, so it's really getting helping them be a little calmer because they're probably in an extreme fight or flight state, and it's not easy when they're in that that state to do anything but be a little upset and worked up. So anything that you can bring them, bring down their anxiety. Um, there's something called tapping, and it's called it's really emotional freedom technique. And since you can't see me, I can't really show this to you. But if you look at your hand, so you're looking at your right hand, and you notice the last two knuckles on your hand, there's a little gap in between on your hand. So there's the bone that comes down from each knuckle, and in between that little gap, if you just tap there with like three fingers, just do a tapping there, that can really calm somebody down. That calms your nervous system. And if you go on Emotional Freedom Technique or just type in tapping.com, there's, there's demonstrations about how to tap. There's several, there are um, meridian points on a person's body and when you tap on those meridian points, it calms their nervous system. That's another really good, useful and fast they, I often will have people go from a nine to a three when they tap. So that's another way to help them calm their, calm their bodies down. And even just doing it as a group can be helpful. There's also YouTubes on how to do it. So you can go on YouTube and put in EFT or tapping and they'll show demonstrations on how to tap. So you can learn it that, that route. So anything that gets them back in their bodies, even having them just breathe into the anxiety and just breathe into where their body pain is or where their anxious feeling is, can help their part of their body relax. The, um, and, and we found that well, so 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 sex trafficking victims can be very resilient and then can and and um, are very can be very motivated to improve their lives. So if you improve functionality, really. Um, um, in sort of more of the traditional milestones, right, that we think of and threshold achievements, which um, they're driven to achieve. 
will, will are, they're able to do that quite quickly, maybe compared to other people in your shelter, if you improve functionality. So I would say that that, that um, is sometimes hard to um, explain to funders that we're doing activities that improve client functionality. It's in the public health research, right? It, you know, smaller um, milestones and threshold um, accomplishments, um, but are significant in that the person becomes more functional and can achieve all that case plan stuff um, um, after that. So. Yeah, thanks. One more? One more question. <clears throat> what are the best options when dealing with more than one trafficking victim in a shelter together? Does this re-traumatize them in some way? I think they often bond, don't they? Yeah, but and I think they usually bond because they feel like they understand each other. I think I think that that's um, when they're when you have an informed, well-trained staff mm -hmm. who understands the trauma, who understands all of what we've talked about. That is what happens almost all the time. Short of that, there isn't sort of a natural compatibility or a natural bond. And in fact, people may resort to some of their more destructive or self-destructive right. coping behaviors. And right. so, um, yeah, that that could happen. But 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 on the other hand, I I um, I'm really comfortable to say that with the you know the trauma informed um, environment and staff that you would find, you know, that supportive um, um, what will, will emerge. Right? Yeah, I mean, they do lack social skills, so you have to remember that they're not necessarily going to use good social skills. That's one of the challenges that they have. But they do feel a camaraderie mm -hmm. with other women that are in their same situation. If, you talk, if, if, if it is discussed really truthfully, yes. I think sometimes, and that really is about facilitation. Right. Um, in a safe environment, when experience can be discussed sort of truthfully um, to the extent that someone feels safe, mm -hmm. I have found that, that the support emerges. Mm -hmm. they, they are really there for each other. Right. I mean, if you feel like there's a lot of conflict, um, just even suggesting, you know, that <clears throat> I'm not sure. I wanted to say having them have a little space from each other can be really helpful if you feel like there's a conflict until they're they're calmed down. Not unusual for one person in high anxiety to create cause another person to go into high anxiety because they don't have those boundaries. So. If one is upset, the other one might, another woman might get upset and also get engaged and anxious. And so sometimes just having them, helping them relax, even having them have time to by themselves, giving them techniques to calm their bodies down. Name it. Yeah, yeah. name it. You know, they're in fight or flight, especially if they're in the shelter. They're in fight or flight. And, and, and that um, part of it, I think, is discussing. Um, I, I, I know that there's a lot of values, clarification sort of type discussions um, going on. And so, you know, kind of having a discussion, is this okay? You know, and just calling it out and naming it um, in a informed, sort of non-judgmental, non-shaming way. But it can be very, very difficult if you don't address it head on. Right. Um, I don't think you could, you, I, I don't think it's a good idea to ignore it, to turn a blind eye to it. Just call it out. Um, I, my experience is that true safety, wherever it is, right, is so rewarded in trust to us as service providers if they feel true safety. And sometimes that is calling something out in, 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 in a non-shaming way, right? right? Right, even just to say, you're not feeling safe right now. That acknowledges what they're feeling. And that part of their brain, when that's in gear, they're not always thinking, I don't feel safe. <coughs> They're just thinking, they're just in high anxiety and trying to figure out how they're going to manage. I, I, I just wanted to add, I, you know, I think who we are encountering in our shelters are um, probably as a whole um, more likely to have some kind of complex trauma, more than one traumatic event. And so I think that we are kind of having to shift a little bit from our, some of the things and the ways we have done things before, um, all the while recognizing that these victims are not that different. What they represent is the kind of um, violence that has happened to them. But as far as 
being our sisters in, in, in being survivors. Um, we've just acknowledged some of the victims on the margins. So, so that's what we're doing. Um, what, what, what the challenges that are presented is the sadistic nature, the breath, the kind of violence that has happened to her. And that's what she's bringing into your house. So, yeah, it's, it, it's um, creating um, new problems to, um, uh, um, to, to have her in the shelter.